Well, hello YouTube. Mike here. Welcome back to my channel. And I would like to introduce you to the Jazz 80 breadboard microcomputer. This is a breadboarded Z80 um, computer system that I have built. And this is the absolutely low-end basic version of it. Minimal useful system. But over the next series of videos I want to put out, we are going to build this up into a much more useful and robust system to where it will be the, the equal or even superior to a lot of stuff that would have been on the market back in the day, 1980s say, home computer wise. Let's go into a little presentation and let me talk a little bit about what this is, why I built it, and what my plans for the future with it are. Okay? Alrighty, so here we go. Sorry for the PowerPoint. I know I hate them too. I hated them when I was working as an engineer. I hated making them. I hated having to present them. I had to say, hated having to sit through other people's presentations, but um, this is probably the easiest way to give you a quick um, introduction to the Jazz 80 computer. And a quick note on the name. I'm sorry if I'm trampling on someone else's name. Um, I did a lot of research and I came up with three or four different names before I named this thing. And, and all of the other names that I came up with were already in use by somebody for their own homebrew computer system. I didn't find anything for Jazz 80, just another Z80 homebrew computer. So hopefully, I'm not stepping on anyone. If I am, I'm sorry. Uh, contact me and let me know. So anyway, uh, this is the Jazz 80, a homebrew computer. Like I said, it stands for just another Z80 homebrew computer because there's so many of them out there and I am throwing my hat in the ring and joining the fray with my own take on it. Um, why a breadboard computer? Well, everybody else seems to have one. Ha ha ha. Uh, if you look on on YouTube, everybody, I mean, there are so many of them out there, from Ben Eater to George Foote to you name it. I mean, people, just dozens and dozens and dozens of people out there with breadboard computers. Not all Z80s, some 6502, some other things. Some have even gone as far as making their own processors out of, dis um, out of uh, discrete components, which, hey, i got to hand it to you. That is that is something. But, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to I'm gonna join the crowd. Um, I always wanted to design and build my own computer. This is a, something I've wanted to do since I was back in college, actually. Um, when I was in high school, and I've mentioned this before in some of my videos, I went to high school in St. Joseph, Michigan, which was just a stone's throw from the Heathkit headquarters in Benton Harbor, Michigan literally a stone's throw. And we actually had a Heathkit um, retail outlet just down the street from the high school I went to. And our school was tricked out with all kinds of Heathkit equipment. Uh, the electronics lab had all kinds of Heathkit electronics trainers. Um, the computer lab had H89 um, computer systems. Um, it was amazing. We had such high-tech stuff in high school. Okay, and I loved it. Got to college, and well, it was a giant step backwards. Um, you know, we were using uh, dumb terminals on timeshare, mini computer system, and it's like, oh, I miss having my own computer system that I could do stuff on. And the, the, the germ of the idea of building my own computer started in college, but I was always too busy and too broke to actually pull it off. I mean, even after I got out of college, I started working, and I was way too busy, you know. And it just, it just never happened. But you know, I would draw and redraw the blueprints on paper with pencil, the old-fashioned way. And uh, but you know, never actually got around to building it. You know, I collected some parts, which I still have, and some of those parts went into the Jazz Eighty. Um, it's a personal challenge. Can I actually do it? After all these decades, can I actually finally build the computer I wanted to build back in college? We'll see. I think I can. I think I'm a long way towards it already. Um, I also needed a development system for debugging um, the uh, Teletext System Master. 
Um, the Teletext System Master was the first major retro computing project I got into. I bought it kind of on a whim off of eBay, saw it for sale, and uh, got it, and I'm like, oh my goodness, what have I got myself into? And I started messing around with it, put power to it, trying to get anything in or out of it, and it was just like inert. It wouldn't do anything. And um, it's like, if I could just write a little code and make sure it works and then put it into the System Master and make sure I can get the System Master going. So um, I had built a um, no-op tester for the Z80 chips a while back, and I had that all breadboarded. And I thought, well, with a little extra effort, I could turn this into a sort of a minimal computer. And um, I could start writing some code for the System Master. So that's what I did. That's, we'll see that a little while, a little further down the road. I kind of turned the no-op tester into the Jazz 80 level junior, which it's below even level zero. But it helped me. Um, this will be a stepping stone to bigger and better things. Um, I'm kind of getting into retro computing big time now, and I have lots of ideas for the future, but I want to make sure I actually know what I'm doing before I tackle the bigger projects. Um, I built a Z80 MBC2 single board computer um, that runs CPM, and it's an amazing little thing. But it really felt like cheating because basically it has a big old Arduino on it that does most of the heavy lifting and the Z80 is just kind of there for looks, although it does actually run code. So I'm like, okay, I'd really like to have something that, that that's a true Z80 microcomputer. So yeah, the Z80 MBC2, it's nice and it has a working CPM system on it, which I may be able to modify later down the road to work with the Jazz 80. So it's good to have a working CPM system if you're gonna try and get a CPM system up and running on another computer. But that's that's way down the road and m other videos so we won't talk too much about that. Yeah I want to be more authentic, less Arduino, more Z80. Um, I already have parts galore. You know over on my main channel I um, render down e-waste for gold and precious metals and a lot of electronic equipment comes through my hands and I will strip off useful parts that I can use for my own projects before that stuff gets rendered down for its gold and precious metals. So I have piles of microprocessors of every single type you can imagine. I have piles of memory chips. I have piles of logic chips, EEPROMs, EEPROMs, you name it, I've got it. And they're just sitting there waiting to be turned into something. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start building stuff with it. Because, hey, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And I think you'll have some fun too as you follow along on this project. So if you are following along, you have to be at least a little bit interested in this. This is my assumptions about you folks who are watching this video. They may be wrong. Leave me a comment and let me know why you're watching this video, what you want to see out of this series. Let me know. But I'm assuming that you're at least a little bit interested in designing and building a computer from scratch or you wouldn't be here. You must have at least some basic knowledge of electronics and digital logic, otherwise you wouldn't even entertain this idea probably. Okay. Some knowledge of programming concepts, um, access to some basic test equipment I hope, you know, an oscilloscope, a logic probe, that kind of stuff. It'll come in handy if you're following along at home and you want to build this too. Uh, you have or can acquire the parts necessary. They're not that expensive. eBay, Amazon, you know, AliExpress, you can get the parts we're going to use. Pretty darn cheap if you don't have them already like I do. I will release schematics and code for anyone wanting to play along at home. So uh, you won't have to do everything yourself. You can copy me if you want or you know, feel free to go your own way. You know, um, you might think that my design is, is a little limited or a little backwards or a little whatever. Feel free to expand in whatever direction you feel like you want to go with your own uh, machine. You know, you may come up with something a lot better than me. So just let me know what you do, you know. 
keep keep in touch and let me know what you're doing with your machine video release schedule videos will come out at irregular intervals because well I'm busy you know not sure how many videos there will be we'll see how long how far we take this I mean I would like to all take it all the way up to having a working CPM 3 system with bank switched RAM and you know all kinds of bells and whistles we'll see if we get that far we'll see if I, I, I might decide that a working CPM 2 system is good enough we'll see we'll see so I'm not sure how far this will go uh, working on it in my spare time have lots of other projects which if you've seen my main channel you know I have lots of other projects so my initial goals were a simple working Z80 based breadboard computer like I said it was an it was an outgrowth of my original no op tester which I expanded because I needed help getting the teletax system master up and running I'll put a link in the upper right and in the video description to the Teletech System Master playlist if you are interested in that. You can see what all I've gone through so far working with the Teletech System Master. I wanted to practice and refresh my Z80 assembly programming, which I have not done in 40 years. So, yeah, I needed a little brushing up. Uh, I wanted a minimal number of chips, but I wasn't trying for one of those crazy three chip systems. But uh, I wasn't going to go nuts the other direction either. Um, mostly using vintage hardware, except for EEPROMs and newer static RAM, which weren't available back in the day. I am not a fanatic about having everything, you know, concourse correct on my retro computer and, you know, vintage parts only. Um, I just want it to work the way I want it to work and uh, you know if I can use 128k static RAM chip and replace um, 16 dynamic RAM chips hey that sounds pretty good to me we are going to stick with through hole parts only at least in the beginning we'll see further down the road what develops but through hole parts only uh, slow clock speed initially for de debugging, 555 timer based. Yeah, 2K EEPROM, EEPROM expandable later. The 2K thing um, is a holdover from dealing with the Teletech System Master because it uh, it can only handle a, a 2K uh, monitor ROM. So I was kind of stuck with that on my development system, but it's pretty easy for me to expand on it, even though I can't expand on the System Master. I can expand on this system easy enough. I wanted one 8-bit parallel output port with LEDs that I could show status and um, I could uh, write pretty patterns out to the LEDs and see that my programs were running the way I expected them to. Um, and of course it's always good to have some blinking lights. It just you know takes me back to the day. Um, one 8-bit parallel input port with dip switches. So yeah, those were the goals for setting up uh, the Jazz 80. Uh, so this is where it all began, the Jazz 80 Junior. Um, this basically has all of that stuff, except there's no memory, okay? It's really an outgrowth of the no-op tester I built to test all of the Z80 chips I'd harvested from e-waste to make sure they were good. And I just expanded on it, added uh, input, output ports, LEDs, and um, an EEPROM socket, and uh, the that's it basically you know I already had the 555 timer to clock the chip I already had a reset button and um, presto I've got a simple computer I can write simple code on it I can see whether it's running by the patterns on the LEDs if they're coming out what I expect them to be um, I can I can input data with the switches and with this I was able to get started on working with the Teletech System Master write some test code for it uh, pop the EEPROM in here. If it worked in here, I could pop the EEPROM in the System Master and run it and make sure that it worked over there. And this was a big help in getting the System Master up and running. But, you know, I knew I could do better. It, like I said, it has no memory. Um, I was just using the internal registers in the Z80, which the Z80 has a lot of internal registers, so unless you're writing something really complicated, you don't actually need a lot of memory. But, uh, yeah, eventually... I wanted to upgrade the Jazz 80 Junior 
and uh, get a, a real real working um, computer system that actually had some memory in it. So that's where we went next. So Jazz 80 Junior improvement goals were to add some RAM and planning for the future I put in 128k. Initially I thought well let me throw in 32k and it's like well let me throw in 64k and I'm like well wait a minute the minimum amount I'm going to need to run CPM3 is 96k. Let me just throw in this 128k chip. Okay so yeah planning for the future I put that in there. Um, don't have any real memory decoding on the Jazz 80 Junior. Basically um, the uh, the A15 line determines whether we're accessing the EEPROM or not. So basically this system um, if, if A15 is low we're reading from the EEPROM okay so we don't really have any memory decoding so you know the the goal was to add some actual real memory decoding so the ROM and the, the RAM could live side by side in perfect harmony so that that was something I needed to add I wanted a faster clock speed so that uh, yeah we could we could run at full speed if we wanted to or we could go back to the the 555 timer you know for slow speed for debugging um, I wanted to expand the EEPROM e -E capacity so we could run basically whatever we wanted in there. Um, I'm going to limit it to 16K for now. But, uh, you know, again, you can do whatever you want. You can do 32K a ROM. You can do 64K a ROM if you want. You know, you'll just have to vary from my design a little bit. But, uh, yeah, so those were the, the goals to get the Jazz 80 Junior boost it up to something a little more useful. And that's where we come up with the, the Jazz 80 computer level zero here. We got the 128K of RAM in there. Uh, we got the uh, 4 megahertz crystal oscillator. Um, we have some real memory decoding down here, which is kind of tucked in behind uh, the EEPROM socket. And I have not yet upgraded the amount of of uh, of ROM this can access, but that's just a matter of moving a few wires around. Okay, so that'll probably be one of the first things we do once we start heading towards level one. We'll start. Um, we'll 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 first um, make sure that we can pop a bigger EEPROM in here and address at least 16k of ROM and then we'll start working on other stuff okay okay so I have made most of the changes so we are pretty much up to Jazz 80 level 0 here and um, I'll give you a quick look at the computer in operation it's just running a simple little program that uh, blinks the LEDs back and forth and uh, talk a little bit about what this kind of computer can do so as I showed in that uh, PowerPoint presentation, it's, it's a fairly simple computer. We got a 4 megahertz Z80 processor over here. Actually, I'm using the NEC version of that right now. Uh, can handle up to 16K of ROM, although I only have 2K installed right now. Um, we have one input port with uh, dip switches for input. We have one output port with LEDs on the output. Got a couple of other LEDs here. One for the clock speed, which you really can't see because I'm running it about as fast as the 555 timer will go, so it, it just kind of looks like it's dimly on. Um, another LED here. This is uh, attached to the M1 line on the processor, so every time we start an M1 cycle, we get a blink out of that LED. We've got a halt LED, but since we haven't halted it, it's, it's not on. Um, got... 128k of RAM memory up here and we ha also have a 4 megahertz crystal oscillator so I can ver um, alternate between whether I want to run slow with the 555 chip which is really helpful for debugging where you can see what's going on especially once you really slow it down or I can run at full 4 megahertz speed if I want to and I, I just have to change where this wire is plugged in and that changes where the processor is getting its clock. Have a reset button over here and that's pretty much it. You know that's the whole system. It's pretty basic. 
got some breadboard real estate left, can add some other things. So down the road, we are going to add some other things and make this into a much more functional and capable machine. What can you do with a system as simple and basic as this? Well, actually, quite a lot. I used it to help get the Teletext System Master up and running because I couldn't get anything out of it at first. So I started writing some test code and I needed another machine to make sure my test code worked. You know, so I built this. And I could run my test code on this and say, okay, I'm getting the output on the LEDs I want. Let me plug the EEPROM in the System Master and see what happens when it runs it. And, you know, I put LEDs on its parallel output port and I got the same pattern output. I'm like, okay, okay, the Teletext System Master is running. I'm having trouble with the original monitor ROM that came with it. Obviously, it's something's not right there, but the code I write for it works. So... Hey, check out that, that, that series on the Teletext System Master. I actually got it up and running pretty good, and I have further, further future plans for it. But uh, So yeah, this was kind of a development system for the System Master, and it worked out really great. But really, it's quite a capable computer, just as it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually overkill for a lot of jobs. Like, this could control the traffic lights at a street corner or something, you know? Um, we have enough inputs and outputs on this to run, you know, a set of street lights at a street corner. We could the yellow, green, uh, red, turn arrow, you know, for two different directions. We got inputs. We can sense whether somebody's pushing the button to cross at the crosswalk. Somebody, we, we have, we could have sensors in the road to determine whether cars are parked and waiting. Um, so yeah, this could do a job like that. It could do lots of jobs, actually. Um, it's probably got a whole lot more memory than it needs for a lot of simple jobs, but we're planning for the future with the memory because we're going to make this into a much more capable computer over time. So, you know, a simple computer like this, it, it could actually do a lot of things. It could run industrial equipment. It could do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, it, it, it was absolutely perfect for what I needed it for, which was a development system for the, the Teletext System Master. But it's done that job. And I am just itching to expand this into a really nice general purpose computing platform. So that's what we're going to do over this series of videos. We're going to expand this and make it into a much better, more capable computer. So yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a fairly capable computer just as it sits. Um, it is very limited in its I.O. It only has one input port and one output port. And um, I'll give you a look at the schematic for this. And I will put the schematics up on my website, on my blog. I will set them up there. So um, if you want to uh, duplicate this, build it at home, you can. The schematic will be there. Um, any test code that I write for this or any kind of code I write for it will be on the blog too. But um, here's a quick look at the schematic. It'd probably be better if I gave you a look at the, the actual KiCad schematic because I can zoom into it better. Okay, so here is the KiCad schematic for the Jazz 80 Level 0 as it sits on the board right now, pretty much. Um, I will uh, zoom in and show you some of the details here. And if, you, if anybody out there sees an error or omission in my schematics, or in any of the other files I put up, like the bill of materials or whatever, please let me know. Leave a comment in this video. I would appreciate it. I have found a lot of mistakes and I have corrected them, but I don't know that I have found them all. It's very hard to, uh, to proofread your own work. You can look at the same mistake a hundred times and not notice it. Anyway, um, here is the ZADA CPU over here in the upper left corner. Um, got all the signals coming off and labeled. A few of them aren't connected to anything. We're not connecting bus, bus act to anything. We're not connecting refresh to anything. We're not using dynamic ramps. We're not using the refresh line. Um, bus act may get used in the future, but right now it is not connected. Um, we've got our EEPROM over here, and I am targeting using a 28C256 EEPROM. Um, I am grounding the A14 line on the EEPROM. So that will mean we'll only be able to use the lower 16K of EEPROM. 
And that's okay because I think 16K is going to be enough for level one when we get there for what I want to do with it. And um, there's an interesting possibility here too. Um, we could always just, you know, we're building this on a breadboard. We could take this line that's going from A14 to ground and we could move it to plus five volts. And if we do that, that would mean that we would be only accessing the upper 16K of this EE, EE problem. So we could have two different programs in here or two different monitors or whatever and we could ac decide which one we want to access just by moving this line from ground to plus 5 volts. So that's, that's a possibility for the future. Um, here is our 128K static RAM chip um, and I am grounding A16 on it so we are only going to be able to access the lower 64K of this chip and our address decoding is going to allow us to only use 48K of that 64K initially down the road we're going to be able to not only use a full 64k in here i'm thinking once we get to like level two level three on the jazz 80 we'll be able to use all of this ram all 128k but i'm planning for the future here once we get a few levels down the road we may use all that okay um here's our address decoding I'll talk a little bit about how that works because it's it's a little bit complicated. Got 74LS138 chip here. It has six inputs. It has three address inputs and it has three enable inputs. And the way this chip works is if all its enables are enabled, the chip's going to wake up and it's going to look at the address lines coming in and whatever number is on the address line it's going to enable the corresponding output line so we've got three address lines we'll have eight possible combinations so whatever numbers on here that's what it's gonna activate out here these are all active lows so they're gonna go low um, when the chip is enabled and it, it reads its address line now I have the high order A2 address line grounded so that's always gonna be a zero and I have the other two address lines connected to A14 and A15 from the processor. There's four different possible combinations these address lines can be in. It could be 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 1. And those would activate the corresponding first four address lines, 0 through 3. Um, we're only interested in zero address line uh, or output zero up here. The only time this chip's going to enable anything is if both of these lines are zero and all of its enables are satisfied. Satisfied, okay? Then this this line right here, output zero, is going to go low, and I have named that line LMEM or low memory. Um, Looking at the enable lines, it has one active high enable line and it has two active low enable lines. Uh, I've got the active high enable line tied to five volts, so it's always going to be enabled. I've got one of the active low enable lines grounded, so it's always going to be enabled. The third enable line, which is also an active low, is tied to memory requests coming from the Z80. Whenever the Z80 issues a memory request, this chip is going to see all of its enables on and it's going to wake up and it's going to look at its address line and if, if A14 and A15 are zeros it's going to enable this output line. It's going to turn it low and LMEM will be low. And if we come up here and we look at our EEPROM we have LMEM coming into its um, active low chip select. So anytime we are addressing the low 16K of memory the EEPROM is going to be enabled. Now sharp eyes have probably noticed that LMEM is coming over here to the RAM too and you might be wondering what is it doing going to the RAM if it's enable line for the, uh, the EEPROM? Well, let's look at this again. LMEM is only going to go low when we are doing a memory request to the lower 16K of memory, right? The rest of the time it's going to be high. It's going to be high if we're addressing higher up in the memory. It's going to be high if we're doing anything else. So it's only low when we are addressing 
um, the low 16k of memory and it's high the rest of the time now if we look at the RAM over here the RAM has two chip select lines so one's active low one's active high so I tie the LMEM line to the active high line on the RAM chip because LMEM needs to be high for accessing the RAM okay that but um, LMEM is always high when we're not accessing the lower 16K of RAM. I mean, LMEM will be high if we're doing an I.O. read or write. LMEM will be high during anything, you know. So um, we also have to gate it with memory requests from the processor. And fortunately, this chip has two chip select lines. So we have an active low chip select, which is tied to memory request. So if LMEM is high and we are doing a memory request then we must be accessing the upper 48k of memory which is going to reside in the RAM chip so that's why we've got LMEM coming over here and this is how our uh, memory address decoding works and hey, it works I've got the got the prototype up and running okay so I was kind of thinking about the future with the amount of RAM I put in there and with the address decoding. Um, the address decoding, we have six inputs here that can determine whether or not LMM goes low. We're going to need most of those inputs in the future. Down the road, when we get to um, like level 1, level 2, level 3 on the Jazz 80, um, the address decoding is going to get a little more complicated. We're going to want to do things like Shadow ROM, we're going to want to be able to do things like read from the ROM and write to the RAM in the same location. They're going to overlap, which is fine as long as you only read from the ROM and write to the RAM. That'll work. We'll want to want to shadow the ROM out of memory entirely so we have a 100% RAM system in the future. So we're going to need these extra lines for um, address decoding in the future. So I was thinking about the future when I put the, uh, the, the you have this amount of RAM in and this memory decoding. Unfortunately, when I first built the uh, the Jazz 80 Junior, it didn't have any memory in it, um, and I was using it to work with the System Master. I wasn't really thinking about the future, so the I/O decoding is super rudimentary. Okay, it it really is not all that good at all. Basically, any I/O read is gonna enable our one input port. And any I.O. write is going to enable our one output port. So basically, <laughs> all 256 inputs and all 256 outputs, any of them are going to enable our, our, our ports here. So, yeah, wasn't thinking about the future on that. When we go to level 1, we're going to have to upgrade our I.O. address decoding. Um, that's going to be one of the first things we're going to have to do because we're going to hang a lot more... Um, I.O. accessories off this machine once we get to level one. So the I.O. address decoding is going to be a little more complicated. Speaking of I.O., the level zero machine, we have um, one output port, uh, 74LS373, that's going to latch the data on the data bus when we do a write to any output port. And we're just going to drive some LEDs um, with uh, that data and uh, it comes in really handy for troubleshooting I found. Now the way I have this written or the, the way I have this drawn I have you know a 10 resistor resistor network here and a 10 LED bar graph here. Um, I didn't actually build it that way and you don't have to build it that way either although I may use LED bar graph in the future um, and I do like resistor networks because they're they're neat and tidy and I do have a one or two on the board. So um, I drew it this way just because drawing in 10 discrete resistors and 10 discrete diodes takes up a whole lot of space on the schematic and this this simplifies it a lot. Okay, And also on the um, level zero machine I have an LED driven by the M1 line and an LED driven by the HALT line on the processor. Just um, so I could see what's going on. It came in handy for troubleshooting early on. Um, you don't have to put that in, and I think we're eventually down the road we're going to get rid of that. Although I do kind of like to have the halt light. Um, 
I can uh, I can I can put a halt at the end of a process. I can know that the processor executed the software to the halt. And uh, when that light lights up, I can say, okay, that all worked. It didn't hang up or go off into La La Land or whatever. So um, the M1 line or the halt line may stay. The M1 line probably won't in the future. Um, we have one input port. We have a 74LS244 that's going to put the value on these switches out on the bus whenever we read from this port, or actually when we read from any port, okay? Um, these lines are pulled up with um, a resistor network. I am actually using a res resistor network here. And um, the switches on the dip switch will ground whichever lines where the switch is closed. And that's one way we can get input into the machine. Well, actually, it's really the only way we can get input into the level zero machine. Um, was helpful for troubleshooting. Okay, down here in the corner we have our two clocks. We have a four megahertz clock which we can run the machine at full speed with. Or we have a 555 clock which runs a whole lot slower which is very helpful for troubleshooting. You can actually see things execute in real time. You slow this down and uh, if you're putting outputs on your uh, LEDs up here you know at certain points in your program you can watch those points go by and you can see how it's executing and if things screw up you can say well where was the last good point where things were get where were we getting the output we were expecting you know it's cheap and easy um, troubleshooting basically um, so the 555 is our slow clock um, I have another LED um, on the slow clock just so we can sort of get a visual indication of how fast we're clocking um, over here we have some pull-up resistors and reset circuitry. Again, I have a resistor network here. And again, I actually have a resistor network in this position, not discrete resistors. Um, let's see, there are four lines on the Z80 we need to pull up for it to run. The non-maskable interrupt line, the interrupt line, the wait line, and the bus request line. They all need to be high on the Z80 or this thing won't run. Those lines are all ways of uh, basically stopping or interrupting what the Z80 is doing. So those four lines need to be pulled up. Uh, that's not to say we won't use these lines in the future. They may well get used, but they need to be pulled up for it to work. So even if we start using non-maskable interrupt, interrupt, wait, bus request, we still got to have the pull-up resistors there, and you got to have them there if you want a working system. Um, Got another pull up here, ROM WE is what I'm calling it, because if we come back up here and we look at our EEPROM again, well, it has a write, an active low write enable input, because it is a writable device, but we're not going to worry about trying to write this in circuit, okay? We will write our software or firmware to it um, out of the circuit in my EEPROM programmer off my laptop and then we'll just plug it into the circuit and run the software. Um, it's There's kind of a, a process you have to go through to be able to write to the EEPROM in circuit. Um, we might tackle that somewhere down the road or I might just leave that as an exercise for the viewer if you want to implement it. But uh, we're not going to implement it. We're just going to hold that line high and uh, not worry about writing to the EEPROM. Um, one of the pull-up resistors is used as part of our reset circuitry. Um, this line goes to the Z80 reset line. Um, it'll also go to a lot of our peripheral reset lines in the future. Um, and when it's low, the Z80 goes into reset mode. It resets itself. And when you first start up the system, um, if you look at the spec sheet for the Z80, the reset needs to be held low for so long so many clock cycles. I forget the exact number, but it has, needs to be held low for so many clock cycles. And that gets the internal registers in the proper setup to, for the machine to run. So what we have here is uh, a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. When you first turn on the power to this thing, basically this is at ground level. And so this is going to pull the reset line low when you first power it on. We have a 10K resistor here. It's going to slowly charge this capacitor up. And as the capacitor charges up towards 5 volts, eventually it's going to go high. Um, the reset line on the Z80 will go high, and the machine will start running. Um, 
we have a push button switch here if we need to reset the machine at any point uh, say we want to start the program over from the beginning or whatever we can just push this button it's going to ground the reset line and discharge this capacitor and as soon as we let up on the button the capacitor will start recharging but the Z80 will have the time it needs to reset its internal registers and it will start running again from ground zero once this capacitor charges back up and this 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 signal goes high uh, it's kind of a rudimentary reset um, circuit we may trick this out in future versions of uh, the Jazz 80 to make it a little more robust but uh, it, it works. It works at the moment. It was quick and easy when I needed something quick and easy. Uh, we have a bunch of decoupling capacitors, attach, one attached to each IC chip. So that's pretty much the whole schematic. I mean, we do have a we do have an unused gate in the 74 LSO2. So I just have the inputs on that grounded. So that's like I say, the pretty much the whole schematic. It is pretty simple as computers go. Um, I wired this up in about a day, got it working, made a couple of minor mistakes, but I found them, and by afternoon I had a working computer, so it shouldn't take you too long to wire this up either. So here we are, level zero, um, schematic I just showed you. So what are our goals to get to level one? And we're, this is, this is where the future videos are going to be as we upgrade the level zero because I've already got the level zero built and it's working. So we're going to upgrade it. Uh, first we need some real IO address decoding because we're going to add a lot more IO devices to this thing so they each need to have their own you know address decoded so that they don't uh, overlap each other. Um, we're going to add a, a baud rate generator, um, a Z80 CTC chip so we're going to add that. Then we're going to add serial IO um, an SIO chip so that we can talk to a terminal or well a virtual terminal on my laptop anyway I don't actually own a dumb terminal or even a smart terminal but you know we'll do we'll do terminal emulation on a laptop and we'll talk to it over a serial line uh, better parallel IO so we'll probably put in a PIO chip That'll give us uh, two parallel I/O ports with lots of handshaking lines. We could uh, run a, we could run a parallel printer port. We could we could do all kinds of stuff with it. We're gonna have a monitor in ROM that's gonna let us do all kinds of stuff with the system um, at 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 a, at a low level on the system with uh, talking to it with the terminal. We'll be able to uh, dump dump the memory. We'll be able to. Uh, program the memory a byte at a time, we'll be able to do this, do that, all kinds of stuff. I actually have a monitor written. I wrote it for the Teletech System Master. I'll have to modify it and recompile it because we're not going with the exact same architecture as the System Master. I was tempted to just duplicate the System Master here, but, um, well, there are some quirks in its design, and I wanted to iron out those quirks, so the, the monitor will be modified and recompiled for um, the Jazz 80 and I will make the monitor code available once we get to that point. Um, eventually I would like to have basic in ROM. Um, one thing I did with the Teletech System Master because I was limited on how much ROM I could have on the board was I just wrote a routine in the ROM that didn't take up very much space that would grab a file over the serial port and put it in memory and then jump to it and um, I was able to load basic interpreter that way and jump to it so I had basic on the system master so we can do something like that or I think 16k is going to give us enough room to have both the monitor and basic in ROM on the board so I think that's what we will try to do what we will aim for okay we may load it via serial in the beginning but I would like to have it in ROM ready to go basically an instant on system you flip the switch and you got basic at your disposal right then you don't have to load it in from the terminal and uh, you're ready to go computing like it's 1982 okay so those are our goals to get to level one I'll give you a quick look at what the level one schematic is going to look like we're not going to go into too much detail on it because we're going to go through um, a lot of this stuff as we add stuff okay let me show you the keycad schematic. 
Okay, so here's the level one schematic. This is what we're building up to in this series of videos because I already have level zero built and working, all right? But we want to expand it into something a lot more useful. We want to we want to get up to level one where we're going to have a much more useful computer. So I'll show you the changes we're going to make to get to level one. First off, we're going to put in real I.O. address decoding. The memory decoding is going to stay pretty much the same, but we're going to put in I.O. address decoding. And we're going to use another 74LS138. We've got its three enable lines down here connected to various um, inputs, M1, I.O. request, A7. I will explain, once we get to the point of building this, why I have it set up this way. Okay? We're going to have chip enable lines going off to our various peripherals that we're going to install. Okay? Now one thing that is going to carry over from the level zero, um, for now I'm going to keep our output port with our LEDs just because it comes in handy for troubleshooting and making sure that the code is doing what you expect it to do. You could have the code write out um, various patterns on the LEDs at certain points as it's executing and um, you, can, you can look at what's on those lights and say Okay, the last time it was doing something correct was here. After that, it went off into La La Land, and you can look at your code and find the problem. So for now, we're going to leave this. Eventually, we will need this board real estate, and I'll get rid of it. But uh, for now, we're going to keep it. But we do need to change the chip we're using. We're going to change to a 74LS374. We had a 373 in here on the level 0. Well, we need a 374 for the level 1 because I've redone the I.O. address decoding scheme and the 373 wasn't going to work with the new scheme, but the 374 should work just fine with it. So we're going to change that out. So probably in the first, in the next video in the series, when we start upgrading from level 0 to level 1, we will install the, um, the IO address decoding, we will upgrade this chip, and we may get to some of this other stuff too. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll see how far we get in that video. Um, another thing we're going to need to get to level one is we need a Z80 CTC chip, counter timer chip. And this is going to generate the bit rates that we're going to need for serial communications. So that's going to be one of the first things we install after we get the I.O. address decoding um, settled. Okay, And we're going to have to write a lot of test code. Um, each time we, we make a change to something, we're going to have to write some test code to make sure it works. We're going to have to write some test code to make sure that the new IDO decoding works and the, uh, the output port here works, the diagnostic output port here works. Um, we're going to have to make sure that we can program up the CTC and get the bit rates out that we want. So we're going to have to write test code for that. Um, once we have the CTC, actually about the same time we put the CTC in, we're going to have to do some other stuff. We're going to take the, the, the slow um, 555 timer clock out, so we need the real estate. And we're just going to take some of the training wheels off of this computer and start turning it into a real grown-up computer here. So we're going to take the uh, 555 timer clock out and we're going to put in a second crystal clock, this one running at 1.8432 megahertz. And the reason we need this clock is because we're running the Z80A at its full 4 megahertz frequency here to get the best performance out of it. But 4 megahertz, you can't divide that down evenly to any common baud rate or bit rate. It just, it just can't be done. And um, you need something like this, this odd frequency, seems odd, yeah. But this will divide down to all the common baud rates easily. So our CTC will use that 1.8432 megahertz input over here, the B clock, and it will use that to divide down to the various bit rates or baud rates that we need for serial communication. So after we get the, the CTC all installed and, and working and programmed the way we want it to, and we have the B clock installed, then we can work look at serial communication. So um, level 1 is going to get um, a Z80 SIO chip and it has two serial ports on it. So 
we'll probably only be using one most of the time but it, you know it comes with two we might as well set up both of them so that they can be used we'll have a we'll have a main one for talking to the terminal we'll have an auxiliary one for something else so we're going to have to write a lot more code to initialize this chip here once we have it wired in and working we're going to have to write some more code to initialize it and then we should be able to um, connect a virtual terminal on my laptop up to one of these two ports and we should be able to talk back and forth and we should have serial communication between the Jazz 80 and a terminal and that's going to make this a whole lot more usable system let me tell you and then down the road we're going to put in a parallel I.O. chip a Z80 PIO chip and that's going to give us two 8-bit parallel ports with handshaking and then once we have the PIO chip in, well, we probably aren't going to need this anymore. We may take that out. I think about that. Like I said, sooner or later, we're going to need to board real estate to get this thing up to, you know, a fully usable system. Several upgrades down the road. But, uh, yeah, so this will eventually do the job of this and more because it has two parallel ports on it. So that's kind of uh, the upgrades we're going to do over the next series of videos to get the level zero, which we already have up and running on the bench right now, up to level one. And like I said before, if you see any errors, omissions, whatever in my schematics, please leave me a comment and let me know. I keep finding errors and I keep fixing them. haven't found any lately, but that doesn't mean I'm not overlooking something. So yeah, let me know if you see something. Thanks. Okay, so that's that's level one. Okay, that's going to get us a pretty usable system, um, especially with basic and ROM, and we can you know talk to the terminal on the motherboard, and you know we'll just we'll just have a blast with it. But we can do better. We can do better. I would like this to take take this to level two eventually, and I'm not going to talk too much about level two because we got to get to level one first. And then we can flesh out what we want to do in level two. But um, level two, Shadow ROM, which we're going to need if we want to have um, a CPM operating system on this thing. We're going to have to have a 100% RAM system, basically. So we need a way to shadow the ROM out of the memory map. And that's why I use that complicated address decoder just to, to select the ROM, because we're going to need some of those other inputs to shadow the ROM. Um, if we want CPM, we got to have a drive. Um, CPM is all about the disk drives, so we're going to have to work on an IDE interface for compact flash drive. Um, I don't think we're going to go actual hard drive, but uh, CF drive is pretty easy to implement. I see a lot of other people doing it, so we'll give that a shot. Then it's um, the big the big job here is going to be the CPM operating system. We're going to have to create. A custom version of CPM for the Jazz 80 and you know I'm maybe getting a little ahead of myself but I've been reading the docs on customizing CPM and it really doesn't look that difficult ha famous last words but you know when we get to level 2 we will work on creating a CPM operating system for the Jazz 80. Um, bank switching for RAM don't really need it for like CPM 2 but if we want to get up to like CPM 3 uh, we will need like bank switching so but I might save that if we take this to level three okay it might not be something we do right off the bat as we're going to level two haven't decided yet level two is not fully fleshed out I'm not even going to show you my preliminary schematics for level two okay we will get there when we get there and then possible future goals for this uh, this system and this whole um, retro computing thing I've got myself into here. Uh, floppy drive interface. Um, I don't know that we actually need a real floppy drive interface on the Jazz 80. Um, it might be interesting to try to implement it. It might be a good learning experience. Uh, it might be very frustrating. I don't know. Um, but it's a possible direction to go. Um, I would like to experiment with keyboard input and video output to create kind of an all-in-one system where I don't need the laptop with the terminal emulator on it anymore. 
you can just turn the computer on and you got video going out to a monitor and you got um, input coming in from a keyboard um, so we might work on that uh, that that that's something I'm very interested in uh, sound generation I would like to experiment with that yeah a lot of the computers back in the day had interesting sound systems on them and you play games and they'd make sounds well you know it would be nice to be able to make sounds with this computer too down the road I'd like to uh, once the once the design is up and running and working well and finalized and set in stone maybe I'd like to design some PC boards and uh, get away from the breadboards to be a lot more reliable a lot more robust if everything was soldered into a PC board rather than you know hooked up on breadboards so we may work in that direction um, implement an expansion bus so that we can hang extra accessories off the computer you know that would be nice you know anything I haven't thought of during the design phase that might want to be added later hey if we got an expansion bus we can just plug the part right in uh, I'd like to fabricate a nice case for it eventually so you know it's not you know so amateurish looking so that's a possibility down the road hey I've got a 3d printer and I'm not afraid to use it so a case will probably be in the offing at some point and then this has been an amazing learning experience um, and you know it's it's got me wanting to branch out into other architectures you know 6502 6809 8085 you know there might be future breadboard computers down the road future series based on other types of processors so that's a good possibility so that's where we might take this but of course that is far down the road first we need to get to here and that's what the next few videos are going to be about so i hope you come along with me for that uh that ride that process i think it's going to be interesting it's probably going to take a while um we're going to do this a little bit at a time as i built this and every time i made a change to it it's like you know one thing at a time make sure you haven't broken what's already there whenever you add a new feature to it so we're gonna we're gonna add one feature at a time make sure we haven't broken what we've got already and then we'll add another feature and make sure it's not bro we haven't broken what we've got there already and we're gonna have to write a lot of software along the way we're gonna have to write a lot of uh, firmware uh, for all of the new functions we're gonna add to this so there's gonna be some videos on on just on how to program this thing too which I think a lot of you will find interesting if you've been watching the videos by people like Ben Eater or George Foote or a lot of other people out there who have breadboard computers. I think you'll find this just as interesting. At least I hope so. And uh, you'll come along with me for the journey as we upgrade this Jazz 80 level 0. We're going to take it up to level 1 over the next however many videos it takes and level one is going to be a much more capable computer it's going to have serial io it's going to have parallel io um, it's going to have a decent monitor in rom and we may even have basic in rom and that will be level one then eventually we're going to go to level two level two we're going to see if we can get um, a cpm operating system running on this we're going to have shadow rom we might have banks, memory bank switching. Um, so we're really going to build up until we've got a really decent machine here. That, like I said, would be the equal of any kind of high-end machine back in the 80s. Maybe even better. So anyway, this is your introduction. This is the first video in the series. And in the next video, we will actually start trying to build up towards level one. So like I said, I hope you come along for this journey. Thanks for watching this far. I appreciate it. Subscribe to see those future videos. Um, they'll be coming out at kind of irregular regular interval as I have time to make them. And um, press the little bell icon YouTube wants you to press to be notified when new videos come out. As a subscriber, you'll be notified when I release those new videos. And check out my second channel, Omega Geek 64 there's always good interesting stuff going on over there and I will see you in the next video thanks a lot for watching this one bye